speaking of my father, um, when Robin and I moved here uh, almost 19 years ago, mom and dad came a month after we got here. And for the first eight years of our ministry here at Trinity Church, dad was our missions pastor and our membership pastor. Oh, my goodness. Some of you remember my father, and some of you came in as members under dad's leadership. My dad was into membership. He wore people out to be members. People became members of our church, went to classes, went through all kinds of homework assignments, became members that didn't even want to be. But dad talked them into it. And they became great, great parts of our church. And some of you are still here today. Um, but about eight years into it, dad developed Alzheimer's and dementia. And over the next seven years, very difficult time for our family. And dad slowly uh, became reclusive and then kind of in the sunlight, uh, sundown of his, ministry, of his ministry and life, really about six months before his passing, uh, Joel Mathis got on a plane with me and uh, two of us moved mom and dad to Fresno, California, where my sister and her husband pastor a huge church called People's Church. They had just built a brand new five-star Alzheimer's center, and my dad was the first patient in that center. And I, I got to say goodbye to him. I went back another time and saw Daddy. Got in bed with him. We hugged. He didn't even know who I was. But I never forget. One day I was on the plane here on a Saturday in Fort Lauderdale. I was on the plane, and we were out on the runway, getting ready to take off, and the phone rang. It was mom's number, and I thought, oh, man, I know what this is. And I picked up the phone, and she said, baby, daddy went home to be with Jesus last night. And I prayed with mom. And then I hung up, and I got to tell you, I turned my head towards the window, and I had a book, and I kind of put the book up against my head and against the window. And for about an hour in flight, I cried like a little baby. I was really crying because... Uh, dad was gone. Uh, he's in heaven. I'll see him again. But for the time being, he wasn't with me anymore. And there were great tears of sorrow. I want to talk a little bit about crying today. It's not going to be a downer message. I'll guarantee you that at least that's what the other crowds have, have affirmed, that it's been pretty good. But, but I want to talk about that a little bit. I want you to look with me to John chapter 20, verses 11 through 16. And by the way, on your chair, we have some notes for you. See Happy Easter at the top. But we've got notes of the message. It will help you follow along. I encourage you to grab hold of those and kind of follow along with us and fill in the blanks. The Bible says in the book of John, Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said. And I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, Tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. In other words, she recognized when he, she, he said her name. Today, I want to talk on this thought for a few moments. Why do you cry? On Easter Sunday, why do you cry? In fact, I want to ask all the fellas in the room, how many of you have ever asked that question before? The fellas that are married, how many of you have ever asked that question before? You know, I've been married for 44 years to Pastor Robin, and I must ask her 300 times in my life, why are you crying? What's the deal? And I can't handle women crying. I, it just kills me. I can't handle it. In fact, 
women on the staff know pastors can't handle it. In fact, if they want to get me, they start crying. It just, it's a joke. I, I don't know, but I just can't deal with it. But I'm telling you, I, I had four sons, so it didn't carry on a whole lot in our house. But now two of the three grandkids are girls, so there's more crying now in my world. You say, well, what are you talking about? No, it's true. Science tells us that girls and ladies cry 5.3 times a month. Shed tears. Are you imagining that? Men, on the other hand, cry 1.3 times a month. Or women cry four times more than guys do. All right? And, and, and it's, it's a tough thing. Now, it's true, and I think everybody would agree with me, men are stronger than women. This whole issue is a hormonal issue. All right? It's hormonal. Men are definitely stronger, by and large, than women. But they are not tougher. Not possible. My little daughter-in-law, Kristen, gave birth nine hours of labor this past Monday. Natural birth, no medication, not one aspirin. When I just mentioned that right now, Pastor Rob was on the front. She's shaking just to hear that. Because all four of our sons were born C-section. And she said, that's why I was born in this modern age, for medication purposes. She was shocked that her daughter-in-law didn't use not even an aspirin. Women are tougher. But they cry. They cry. There's five different reasons why you cry. One, of course, is you cry tears of joy, gladness. Some of you have seen stories on the news of uh, soldiers coming home from war, uh, and they show up at a big public place where thousands of people are gathered, and, and the parents are there, and the parents didn't know that they were coming home, and it's just a shock. And I found one of these on the Internet, a young man coming home from Afghanistan uh, to the Boston Celtics basketball game. At halftime, he comes in the stadium, and mom and dad are there. They don't know he's coming. I thought you'd like to watch it. I think we can uh, make it. When Air is. Force National Guard Sergeant Matthew Knowles suddenly walked onto the court, his mom and his family stunned and overjoyed because just moments earlier, there was a big She's message actually happy. on the Jumbotron saying he was still overseas. Players and fans gave him a standing ovation, and to that we say, welcome home, Sergeant Knowles. No, she, she wasn't upset. She was happy. And she was crying because she was happy. Hello. Tears of joy. There's another kind of a tear. Some of you uh, saw years ago at Whitney Houston's funeral. It was, it was telecast live. And uh, Ray J was there. And as that casket was being taken down the aisle, Ray J just kind of lost. I thought I could show you this tears of sorrow. See him there on, on the right. Got his hand on the casket. Don't cry. We both know I'm not what you, you need. Yeah, sorry. We all know about tears of sorrow. Those are just kind of normal tears. Tears of sorrow are normal. Tears of joy, those are normal. But then there's three other kind of tears, and they come from anger, disgust, and fear. Some of you have been there before in your life. I've got a picture of this little girl. She's just ticked, and she's crying because she's just ticked off. She is angry. <laughs> And then I've got a picture of this guy. He's just disgusted, and he's, he's crying tears of disgust. Can we put that up there? I think we've got the Will Ferrell shot there, just disgusted, out of his mind. Okay, it's happening again. The frozen computer. We pay a million dollars for these computers. They freeze. Okay, anyway, but you've known people that they, they cry out of disgust. And then there's those that are actually cry out of fear. And, and friends, let me say this today. Perhaps you came to Easter Sunday services at Trinity Church, and maybe you've been battling fear or disgust 
or anger. Maybe you've even wept tears as it relates to one of those three issues. And I don't believe that's the will of God. All of us cry, and crying is good. It, it, there's something about washing the tear ducts, and there's an emotional release that takes place. But when they are the result of anger and disgust and fear, those are characteristics that God has not called us to. God wants to deliver us from those kinds of tears. And I want to share with you today how I believe that can happen if you'll open your heart. First of all, decide what you want. What's your dream? Really? You came in here today and some of you just don't really know what you want. And I believe God's calling us. Define it. Write it down. What do you want? You say, well, Pastor Rich, I think that's self-serving. I, I think that's selfish to even promote what I want. Really? Well, that's not what the Bible says. Look at John chapter 1. Verses 35 through 38, the next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? Jesus says, what do you want? And, and you're probably thinking today while I asked that question that Jesus asked, well, pastor, it's obvious they, they didn't want to follow John the Baptist anymore. They wanted to follow Jesus. Well, really? Are you sure that's what they wanted? Here's another one, Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 51. Another story. Then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. I love this. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Now, when you hear that story read, you say, well, of course he wanted to see. That was a dumb question. The guy's blind. He wants to see. Really? Really? How many times have you seen commercials or you've seen an advertisement or you've heard a story or you know someone who's dying with lung cancer and the whole time you're talking to them dying with lung cancer, they're chain smoking cigarettes. Well, you think they want to be healed of lung cancer, but their actions aren't necessarily defining that for you. Until a person says what they want, Sometimes they don't know what they want. Jesus says, write it down. Talk to me. Tell me. Here's another one. John chapter 5, verse 2, 3, 5, and 6. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the sheep gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda. I've been there. Some of you have been there with me. And it's surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he says, asked him, do you want to get, do you, do you want to get well? I mean, you've been laying here for 38 years. Would you like to get well? What do you want? What do you want? Friends, there comes a point in every man and woman's life where Jesus approaches you, approaches me, and says, tell me what you want. Write it down. What is your dream? What is your vision? Where do you want to go with your life? Start there. The second thing that I want to say about that today is this. 
Make up your mind that discouragement is no longer in your vocabulary. Once you have discovered and defined and written down what you want, what your dream is, what your vision is, then determine that discouragement will no longer be in my vocabulary, which means it won't be in my thought patterns. It won't be in my mind. I won't recognize it when it comes knocking on my door because discouragement is not a part of my life. You must realize, church, that when you have a dream, you have a goal, and as you're pursuing that goal and you fail in that pursuit in a given instance, it's not really failure. It's just feedback to you on how not to reach your goal. And, and once you try something and you fail in that try, you can say, well, I won't try that again. That didn't help me reach my goal. I'm not going there again. One of the greatest American inventors was named Thomas Edison. If you've ever had an American history class in high school or university, you certainly have studied Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. Did you know that Thomas Edison during the period of time that he was inventing the light bulb, failed 10,000 different times. 10,000 of his tries were unsuccessful until he finally invented the light bulb that lights this room up today. And here's what he said. I love this quote. We're going to put it up there for you. Thomas Edison I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. I'm going to tell you something. That is a victorious way of approaching your dream. The discouragement is not going to be a part of your vocabulary. It's not going to be in my mind. I won't recognize it when it comes knocking on my front door. I have a picture of an elderly woman by the name of Nola Oaks. In this picture, Nola has gone back to university in the year 2007. I think she's pretty good looking for 95 because that's how old she is. Now, you need to know that 77 years earlier, at the age of 19, in the year of 1930, she let, left Fort Hayes University in Kansas with 30 hours left to go for her bachelor's in education to get married. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> she got married. She and her husband started a farm, started having babies. Babies grew up, big farm. Then the babies got married. They started having babies. Then the babies grew up. And they started having babies. At 95, Nola Oaks' husband had passed away. She was the widowed great-grandmother of 15 great-grandkids. She left the farm and moved back into the big city in Kansas and rented an apartment and finished her bachelor in education degree at 95 but she wasn't finished she stayed for three more years and worked her head off and at the end of three years presented a 50 page research manuscript that when she turned it in she received her master's degree in education at 98 years of age. Why? Because the word discouragement was not in Nola Oaks' vocabulary. Wasn't in her brain. She never recognized it when it knocked on her door. She kept moving forward towards her dream. I love this man. His name is Jacob Tempo. And Jacob 
at the age of six, living in Sudan, his mother and father were slaughtered in the Sudanese Civil War. Jacob joined a thousand other children on a nine-year journey from Sudan, South Sudan, to Ethiopia. Now, friends, you can imagine what happened to a thousand kids over a nine-year period of time walking from Sudan to Ethiopia. You can imagine the pains. You can imagine the suffering. Hundreds of the children died along the way. But somehow, Jacob Atim finally arrived in Ethiopia with hundreds of other children, and immediately, this poor, broken boy was picked up by a society known as the Orphan Lost Boys of Sudan. And a group of these young men were sent to the United States. Now, Jacob Atim had never heard of the United States or America, but when he got here, he quickly learned English. In fact, within about a year and a half, he'd mastered the language. He was on a fast track in education. He got to Central Michigan University, and in four years, he graduated with a degree in social engineering, and upon graduation, he went back to South Sudan, and he was the founder of the Mar South Sudanese Medical Clinic. It became known throughout South Sudan. It touched the lives of thousands of people. So that in 2008, Jacob Atim was brought back to the state of Florida to work on his PhD at the University of Florida, yes, he finished his PhD and is now back in Sudan creating medical clinics all over the nation. Why? Because this orphaned little boy would not let discouragement be a part of his vocabulary or his way of thinking. He never recognized the, the, the word when it came knocking on his door. Friend, today, if you want to win, if you want to realize your dreams and vision. I say today, it's time to get rid of tears that emanate from fear and anger and disgust. It's time to say, I'm not going to be discouraged. I'm just going to keep moving towards my dream until I win. If you believe it today, church, say amen. amen. <laughs> oh, man. The last thing I want to say. First of all, Jesus is asking you on this Easter Sunday, what do you want? Write your dream down. No more hit and miss. Write it down. Secondly, decide that the word discouragement is no longer going to be in your vocabulary. And last of all, decide that the work it will take to see your dream come to pass is more joyful than the comfort you think you need. How many people have lost their dream? They gave up on their vision because it was just too hard. Oh, I just got so tired. Hello? That's part of it. Hard work is part of it. Not giving up is part of it. Jesus said in Luke chapter 9 and verse 62, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. In other words, put your hand to the plow and just keep on working. I've talked to so many young men and young women who were in school and then dropped out. It was just, I just had too much going, Pastor Rich. So you're 21 and you had too much going? Don't talk to me about too much going. I got 130 employees. I've got a big church. We've got three churches and in, in, in five churches in three states. Uh, uh, we've got all kinds of. Uh, I, I, I'm working on my doctoral program right now. I could go on and don't talk to me about it. it was just too much, Pastor Rich. I was 21. Just too much. 
Are you married? No. You got kids? No. Well, what are you doing? Well, I, I, I took a break. Yeah, take a break because you thought you needed some comfort. You've got to find joy in work, not joy in laziness. You've got to come to a place where nothing's going to get in the way of my dream. People won't. Fear won't. Laziness won't. Nothing's going to get in the way of my dream. I'm going to see this thing through. Work becomes your joy. Ha, I love this one. Hardship becomes a blessing to me because it toughens me up for future victory. Amen. Amen. Tough people keep going. You know, this is Easter, and I remember a number of Easter's ago. In fact, I remember almost 19 years ago when Robin and I first came from the Seattle area to Miami, the pastor of the Trinity Church, 107 people voted us in for life as the pastors of this church. And I heard that 12 of the 107 voted against us. So on the first Sunday, and some of you were there, when I got up to preach, I said, now I understand that 12 of you voted against me. So if you'll let me know who you are, since we don't know each other, I'll take you to the greatest steak dinner of your choice. Any restaurant, whatever Denny's you'd like to, no, 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 no. I got to tell you something. Nobody ever came and told me they voted against me. But we started and never dreamed out of that little crowd of people that we would see what's happened. But I'll never forget coming to Miami. Robin said to me, Rich, I'm only coming to this city because I believe God wants to give us 10,000 people. I said, okay, I'll agree with you on that, hon. I'm with you. And I, I, I'll never forget, how many, were any of you ever in our dome tent on I-95, look at that, wow, on I-95, the dome tent, remember that, the air dome, so much fun, oh wow, the rain was so much fun, so much fun, it was our first Easter under the dome tent, and we had a bunch of services that day, and at the end of the day, with kids and everybody, we would counted 2,900 people, I think we'd only been there about four years. Man, I got in the truck at the end of the day, and Rob was in there, and I went, 2,900 people, we're done. We could go to heaven now. 2,900 people in our church. She went, hey, no, 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 no. We're going to have 10,000 people. One day we're going to have 10,000 people. I went, 2,900 is pretty good. She went, 10,000. And folks, we never knew it would be this hard. We worked, just laboring, prayer, fasting, work, prayer, fasting, strategizing, planning, prayer, work, fasting. Our team that's with us, what do we do? Prayer, work, fasting. <laughs> that's what we do. And, and, and we love people who work, pray, fast, plan, strategize. That's what we do. Some didn't want to do that. So they're not here now. And we always would say to them, you know, don't leave mad, just leave. Because we're on a mission. And friends, I never dreamed it would take almost 19 years. But you know, Ford Motor Company started in Henry Ford's garage. They said, what are you doing? Because I'm going to make a horseless carriage. I said, you're nuts. One day, he drove the horseless carriage with no horse or donkey to pull it. And people were shocked. And pretty soon, we already have electric cars. But pretty soon, we'll have driverless cars. That's coming real quick. <laughs> and there are Ford massive Ford plants in 10 different nations of the world now. And across this country, there are Ford plants. And I drive two Fords. 
And it doesn't mean fix or repair daily. They've been really good cars for me. 166,000 employees. Oh, he's been in heaven for 100 years already. But the point is he had a dream. Today, in three states, in five churches, for the first time since Rob and I moved here, we will cross the 10,000 people mark. In New York, in San Diego, three churches here in Miami. They say, well, Pastor, you shouldn't get so involved in numbers. It was just a goal. It was just a goal. If there was just one person here today, Jesus died for that one person. But the point is, we had a goal. We want to touch people. We want to see people get saved. And today, God brought our vision to pass. How did it happen? Keep working. Discouragement's not going to be part of our vocabulary. And guess what? <laughs> We're going to find more joy in work than we do in comfort. You know when you get to take it easy? When your great-grandma, Nola Oaks, when you got a bunch of great-grandkids, then you can sit back and say, more tea, iced tea, extra ice, yes, bring, bring, bring me, serve me. I'm a hundred, quickly. And all the great-grandkids, oh, my goodness, Grandpa, oh, dear God, he, he needs more iced tea, quickly. That's when you can take, no, because we're on a mission. What do you want? Are you willing to wipe discouragement out of your vocabulary? Are you willing today to decide that work is going to be more fun than comfort will ever be for me? With God's help, I'm going to see. And this passage of Scripture wraps the day. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. In your relationships with one another, your apostle writes, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's what Easter Sunday is all about. It's not about I don't get any respect. He dissed me. She dissed me. Let me tell you something. If anybody was ever disc in history, it was Jesus Christ. But now 2,000 years later, millions of people around the world are bowing at his name. Why? Because he decided that discouragement would not be a part of the mix. He knew where he was going. And he found more joy in the work and the mission God gave him than in laying in the corner somewhere complaining. I want you to bow your head.